Well, welcome, Ooh, Dr. Lane. I am super excited to talk about the soil food web today. Um, yeah, I, I just want you to uh, kind of introduce yourself and how you even got into your passion or all of that, all of that good stuff. It's always a convoluted story, you know, so uh, I'm Dr. Elaine Ingham, and uh, I have worked in the area of soil microbiology, soil ecology um, for the last 45 years. Wow. Um, yeah, awesome. it's been a while. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that old, am I? No, no, not at all. Uh, yeah, not at all. Not, not at yeah. all. So, you know, when you add a, another 20 years on front on the, you know, end of the of the uh 45 in order to account for all that schooling and stuff yeah <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. i'm 60 you're only years halfway old. there <laughs> i always say i'm i'm aiming i want to live until i'm 150 you Ooh, know because unless goal. you aim at something you won't hit it yeah so I like that. Perfect. yeah so I ha i'm not even half the distance to that <laughs> exactly <laughs> you're not even halfway there <laughs> And I have, a, yeah, so plenty of time to get things done, do things. And uh, I hope the next 45 years is as productive as the first 45 has been. Yeah, I sure yeah. hope so too. So the way I got into all of this was basically, um, I have my father to blame for it, I guess is really what I have to say. Um, my father was a veterinarian. He was uh, the head of the Department of Pharmacology and Physiology mm -hmm. in Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota. And awesome. he had three daughters. So he, you know, no son. So mm -hmm. I was the one of the three girls. I was the tomboy. You know, I'm the one who fell out of trees and didn't actually break anything, thank goodness. Um, you know, flying through the air on a swing and you know, let's see what it's like if you just kind of jump off the swing and it's yep. at its height yep. and into the concrete. Yeah, that was fun. Lost my front teeth. And so my dad would take me with him when he went out to uh, answer a call. Mm -hmm. um, as a head of vet veterinary medicine at the University of Minnesota, he got to come, come out whenever a, a big client had a serious problem and, you know, we're all, all up in the air. He's going to sue everybody. He's going to, you know, and my dad would go out to try and find out why his dairy hurt, mm -hmm. um, why the animals were dying, mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. what was the problem. And he would bring me along when he could. And he would, you know, pull out his examples of the poisonous plants, and mm. say, "Now I want you to play with the with the um, clients' kids, um, and while you're out there in the field, keep an eye out for these plants mm. and tell me if you see any of these plants out in the field." Oh. And so I was my father's spy yep. because yep. he, you know, he was in the barn trying to get these animals to recover and get them back on their feet and things and I was the one outside um, looking at what the forage was what the mm. food was in the pastures and there were quite a few times where I'd be out there we'd be playing tag or you know they wanted me to go out on the tractor and do something and find we would do that and I'd be going there's nothing but water hemlock in this uh -oh. field is if you put the animals out here they have nothing to eat right. except a poisonous plant. So how odd that the dairy cows would go out there and eat something. And that makes sense. And then, okay, now they've got staggers. Now they're, um, uh, you know, responding to any sunlight by trying to avoid it. Mm. Um, they're finally going down on their um, knees and on their sides and, you know, pass and uh -huh. passing out and dying. Wow. Um, so when we when I came back in, my dad would kind of grab me and say, so what did you see? And I could explain to him. Right. And there were times when, oh, absolutely. The wonderful pasture, good grass, no problems. Mm -hmm. And then my dad could, that would help him come to understand that there was something wrong with the feed mm. um, that was in the bags. And so that's, that's where I got started. Um, enjoying being out on the farm and working with animals and being involved with plants. Mm. And then um, when I was in um, college, I have a double major in biology and chemistry. Awesome. And so of course I'm gonna be turn out to do something biochemistry. Mm -hmm. um, mm. 
And I got very interested in the organisms in the soil uh, when I went to Colorado State University. Mm -hmm. And I worked with groups of people that were trying to figure out why are these organisms present in the soil? Mm -hmm. We know these organisms live in the soil. Every place you go on the planet, you find these organisms, even in the Antarctic and the mm -hmm. Arctic. Yeah, You have okay. living bacteria, fungi, maybe not so much or, much or only in certain areas, mm -hmm. protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, all the whole you know, groups of organisms in the oh, soil, yeah. they're there. And why? Why does yeah. mother nature keep spending energy on them right should be when important. I, yeah they you would you think that mother nature being mother nature she's not gonna keep giving energy mm -hmm. to something that was making no difference that right. wasn't performing some function that nature wants done they have to be out there for a reason mm -hmm. and when I started my PhD work at Colorado State University my major professor wanted me to work on how to assay fungal biomass, total fungal biomass and active fungal biomass. None of the other methods that were being used, uh, plate counts or enzyme assays or DNA or uh, phospholipid fatty acids, PLFAs, mm. none of them actually measure total mm. fungal biomass or total okay. bacterial biomass or, you know, and do you need to know the difference between fungi and bacteria and protozoa right. and nematodes. And, and unless you start to figure out what do these organisms do in the soil, you can't answer that question. Right, right. So he sent me around to all these other people at, at the university and all the professors in soil science that worked with soil, um, both the people in agronomy that had their focus on the soil, the, the people in um, hydroponics or aquaculture or any uh, in horticulture, mm -hmm. uh, forest science, all of those, you know, go talk to them all yeah. and ask them if this project that you're doing for your PhD, um, what they thought about it and whether it was worthwhile doing. Mm -hmm. And to a man, and it, it's always interesting me to think about the fact that they were all men. Mm, of course. There were no women professors, uh, especially in agronomy, you know, right. oh, yeah. women can't do agronomy. Uh, we're the ones who keep gardens at home. <laughs> we grow all kinds of right. plants. Don't, don't tell me I can't deal with big equipment. Yeah. Um, so uh, all guys and they all to a man said, oh, that's, that would be terrible if you um, did your PhD on these organisms in the soil because they're not important. They oh don't do gosh. anything. They're, they're just there. Um, <sighs> You go out and you put on a pesticide and yeah, sure, you're going to kill a few, but it, that doesn't matter. Um, they just come back. By oh. tomorrow, they're all back. Oh. And it's where, where do you think they're coming from? Yeah. If you think that they're all back, I can show you clear cuts up in the Pacific Northwest where, you know, there's, it's five miles from the center of that clear cut. Mm -hmm to the untouched forest or the second growth or third growth forest. Mm. Um, there's a source of the organisms. How long is it going to take them to get from about five miles away back into the center? Right, right. And there are some plots that we've been working on that, gosh, it must be uh, 50 years ago. They were wow. clear cut. Okay. And the biology still has not returned oh. in anything that's even close to healthy wow in the middle of those clear cuts um oh, so it doesn't you know you know half a mile is a significant period of time mm -hmm. before those organisms can get back and you can start getting all these benefits been all the benefits back into the system wow so there was no comprehension of the benefits mm -hmm. that these organisms would give you in the soil and whether you could get all the benefits from one species of bacteria, which, you know, just think about that for a few seconds <laughs> and you can just start laughing hysterically because <laughs> it's, it's insane. Yeah. One species of bacteria is going to do everything. Oh. I don't think so. No. And Why you need fun. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Why should we worry about diversity? Because, you know, we can put out uh, two or three or five or 10. Mm. Well, in a healthy soil, you may be seeing as many as 75 
thousand species in a teaspoon of soil. Yeah, yeah that's incredible. And then it's going to be a different set, not completely different, but it's going to be a different mix mm -hmm. in the next gram over and in the next right. teaspoon and the next one and the next one. And so what's the diversity of organisms that you need to have? Mm -hmm. um, people at the Center for Microbial Ecology at Michigan State University are suggesting that there are at least a million different species of bacteria alone mm -hmm. wow. in a woodlot, in your standard woodlot. And as soon as you get out of Michigan, it's a different set of bacteria right. when you get to Illinois or Oklahoma or Oregon or California or Timbuktu or, <laughs> you know, Southeast Asia, wherever it is you want to go. Right. How many species of bacteria are there on this planet? We haven't even begun to it. count that. <laughs> I doubt we'll and ever really know the real number. <laughs> <laughs> maybe someday you know i'm waiting for like you know in star trek when they would have um, <laughs> um dr Bashan would point it at the soil and he would be able to say look at it and go oh, ah yeah. yes we have all the microorganisms we need <laughs> to be able to do agriculture on this planet and it was That's... just like give me one of those i want one of those <laughs> that would be so cool <laughs> it would be so cool just point it at the soil and yes. all the information you want comes right up there on the screen oh my gosh i'm we're working towards that. We're trying, okay. <laughs> but not in my lifetime, probably. Yeah. Wow, that's really yep. interesting. Yep. So, so um, trying to understand what biology does and why it's important. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I kind of giggle when I look back at those professors that were just mm -hmm. horrified. You're not going to be able to get a job if you do this for your PhD work because wow. these are just totally unimportant. Mm. And, what do you know? Yeah. <laughs> world famous causing trouble <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so yeah just explain kind of what uh the soil food web is and kind of what what makes up of it like the categories that you were mentioning before yep so um the soil food web is basically uh bacteria and we want the good guy bacteria, not the bad guy bacteria. Mm -hmm. And how do you select for the good ones to be the ones hanging out as opposed to the bad ones hanging mm -hmm. out? And if you kind of think of it like human society, what makes the good town, part of town be good? What mm -hmm. have we done? What do you have to do in order that there are no gangs, there's no violence, there's no, how do you make that part of town be safe? Right. And then... The bad part of the town where if you go walking through it um if you, if you look prosperous mm -hmm. you're gonna get you know the, the gang is gonna get you you're gonna get pickpocketed or you're gonna get yeah all the unpleasant things how do you how what is it that allows it to be like that right. and when we're talking about soil we're basically talking about the difference between aerobic environments mm -hmm. and anaerobic environments where all of the bad stuff is happening. You can't breathe right. You can't catch a breath because of all the toxics in the air. There isn't enough oxygen. Mm. Well, that kind of works for the bad part of town, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Um, you are going to be in a situation where the bad guys rule. They've mm -hmm. got the upper hand. How do you make certain that you can keep your environment aerobic, that you can have things clean and well arranged and ordered in a pleasant manner that's not dictatorial? Um, and that's kind of the same thing you have to do with soil. We've got to maintain aerobic conditions. We have to have food for the organisms to be there. We've got to have space. Mm -hmm. They've got to be able to build what they want to build. So are you going to you know, live in um, you know, beautiful high rise apartments, or is everybody's going to live on the shore of the beautiful um, ocean or lake or river or whatever? Um, you've got to implement certain standards yeah. to make certain that the good guys are the ones that are going to flourish. Mm -hmm. So that works for bacteria, also fungi, protozoa, nematodes. Bad guy nematodes are the root feeders. The good guy mm. nematodes are the things that prevent root feeding nematodes okay. from being able to take over. Mm. So here's the cast of characters that we want to have. Yeah. Easy for us to look through a microscope 
and see whether we've got lots of bacteria or, or you know, kind of a normal amount or maybe a little low or oops, what, what happened to the bacteria? Mm -hmm. And then the fungi, same thing. We want to be growing the good guy fungi that do all the beneficial things for the plant. Um, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, incotraeids, spiders, all the different things mm. in soil that all contribute to the way things function. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, do you need like an equal proportion or do you want a specific percentage of each in the soil? It depends on what you're growing. Okay. Because that's how nature has controlled succession. Mm hmm if all you've got growing present in your soil is a bunch of the bad bacteria, compacted air can't get in there, the only thing that's going to be present are the bad guy bacteria. Mm. Um, now, how are you going to move to the next stage of succession where a few plants are going to start growing because there's enough nutrient cycling starting to happen? That means you've got to get some of the good guy bacteria in there and you've got mm -hmm. to get some of their predators because the bacteria are going to be pulling into their bodies all of the nutrients that any cell has to have. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, most cells are more or less balanced at the same place in terms of nutrients inside their bodies. Mm -hmm. But then it's the balance of what kinds of cells doing what kinds of of work that start to now we've got to have fungi now we've got to have protozoa and nematodes mm -hmm. now we've got to have protozoa and nematodes and microarthropods in this food web mm -hmm. the ratio of fungi and bacteria are very very important as well so when we start out at the beginning of succession the only thing you can grow is weeds it's only bacterial. Mm, so our okay. fungi are at zero or very close to right. non-existent. Your bacteria are doing all of the work of building soil structure, trying to help the plants, but there's not enough nutrient cycling happening. Right. So the only thing you can grow are weeds mm -hmm. that just put their roots into the soil a little bit. They're gonna suck all the nutrients up that they possibly can use them to go into reproductive mold, um, mode, make a billion little seeds that all go off. And mm -hmm. so pretty soon all you've got is a big uh, thistle field okay. or you've got ragwort or, you know, all the horrible diseases that you can, or not, excuse me, not diseases, uh, weeds that you mm -hmm. can think of. Well, but those weeds are very important because they are starting to put a little bit of cellulose into mm. the soil so when they die yep. those that little bit of root system the little bit of residue that goes onto the surface of the soil has cellulose in it and that's a fungal food right so right. now the fungi are going to start picking up that means you can grow the next stage of succession plants early successional grasses like bromus and bermuda okay. grass you can start to grow things like dandelions. And mm -hmm. most people think of dandelions as being horrible weeds, but they're way less problematical mm -hmm. than some of the earlier successional weed species. Right. So, right. you know, we're moving along, but yeah, there's still some weedy type plants that can grow, mm -hmm. but you can grow your kale and your cold crops and your mustards. Right. And in that ratio of here's our bacteria, and now we've got some fungi in there mm. too. Okay, yeah. So lots of bacterial foods being made, but some fungal. Right. So that soil slowly but surely creeps up into, mm -hmm. um, eventually they're going to be able to grow the next stage of succession because you'll get more cellulose than bacterial food. Mm. And so oh, we move... Cool. Yeah, we move into the next stage of succession. So here we grow growing mid-successional grass species like the poas, um, mm -hmm. some of our favorite vegetables like carrots and onions and garlic, things like that. And they need a little bit more fungal biomass in the soil right. so they can outcompete the earlier successions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, now we're growing those kinds of plants. They put in way more fungal foods than they do 
bacterial food. So now the fungi are coming up mm. and now they're almost equal bi fungal right. to bacterial biomass, which means you're going to be growing row crops, oh, you're going to grow okay. corn and wheat and barley and some of the more productive grass species. Mm -hmm. You want to have happy, healthy cows you better have a fungal to bacterial biomass ratio mm. that is just about equal or right in that range, Perfect. or you can't grow the highly productive grasses. Right. You're not going to be able to have as many cows on your field mm. if you're not growing the highly productive grass species. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. But of course, that means you're getting a lot more cellulose and now some lignans mm -hmm. are being produced, some terpenes, some of those way more complex compounds. And so you're gonna be um, set, um, selecting for mm -hmm. more fungal biomass than bacteria, which means now you're going to be growing shrubs, mm -hmm. vines. And so grape vines require you know, two to five times more fungal biomass than bacteria. Okay. You real, you want both of them both to be really high, right? But you've got to have that balance correct. Yeah. So you're setting the stage for the right forms mm. of specific nutrients that those shrubs, that those vines require. As you keep growing more and more of the shrubs and vines, more fungal foods. And now your fungal to bacterial ratio gets to be much wider, right. maybe five times more fungi than bacteria to a hundred to a hundred times more fungal than bacteria, and so you're selecting for deciduous trees. Okay, wow. And we all I know there's this. kind of succession going from like aspen and poplar and mm -hmm. birch into the oaks into the um, more you know the walnuts and things like that. Is you're moving along that successional gradient. But at a certain point, that fungal to bacterial biomass ratio gets wide enough mm -hmm. that it now starts selecting for rhododendrons, for azaleas, things that are on the cusp of you're going to be growing an old growth forest someday mm -hmm. if disturbance is kept at bay for a long enough period of time. Wow. So when you think about that process of going, moving in succession, you know, moving along that successional gradient, mm -hmm. it is the biology in the soil that controls what plants mm -hmm. you can grow in a healthy, highly productive fashion. Yeah. If you don't have that fungal to biomass ratio where the plant you want to grow is going to be happy, right. you're right. not going to have healthy production. Right. Because if a plant isn't getting all the nutrients it needs every second of every day in order to keep it healthy, mm -hmm. it's going to be stressed. It's not going to be able to resist those diseases when the insects or the diseases come to call. There's nothing that that plant can do to protect itself mm -hmm. against those diseases or those pests. So you got to get that biology right. Mm -hmm. You got to get those organisms that are in that root system in the soil They've got to be carried up onto the above ground part of the plant. So every part of that leaf material is covered with these beneficial organisms. And then here's that leaf, say, and you've got some kind of aphid buzzing by looking for some place to set up housekeeping. <laughs> it won't even recognize that that's a plant. It doesn't recognize that this is a leaf oh. if you've got really good coverage of all these organisms on oh, the surfaces. Interesting. That, um, you know, like an apple, um, uh, you know, one of the things that attacks the little apples. Mm. Um, if it, that apple is completely covered with this highly beneficial set of organisms, that guy won't recognize that fly, won't mm -hmm. recognize that that's an apple. It just keeps flying by looking for an apple mm. and your crop is protected mm. then. And, and so it's uh, a benefit. So okay. we suppress diseases and um, um, pesticides, uh, pests, all those problem organisms are kept at bay mm. if you've got the right biology. Now, the first year where you're converting over from something that's dirt, that doesn't have the biology in it that your plants require, then there's no way to get those organisms onto the foliage. Mm. Okay. We've got to bring the soil up to speed first. So when we start doing this conversion, 
we're going to probably start in the fall where we were going to put in compost that's got absolutely all the sets of organisms in, in it that we need. Let them have all winter long to start colonizing, start growing, start doing the job. Come springtime, temperatures warm up, all those bacteria and fungi, protozoa and nematodes, nematodes start working even faster. Mm -hmm. um, and so now they're being uh, raised by the exudates of what's coming out of your, your root system. Yeah. Can you Plants. explain what, uh, or define that word for people? Yep, yep, exudates. They're, you know, it's like every, um, every trade, every profession that there is, they develop their own language. Mm. And so in the world of soil microbiology, soil ecology, um, exudates are those things that are released, those compounds that are released from the root system of the plant. So think of some of the human exudates. So when you sneeze, achoo, and you've got mm. all that slimy stuff, that's exudate. <laughs> I like your analogies. <laughs> well, you got to help love people. It. Yeah, because it, otherwise it's like, okay, exudates, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the plant is releasing, just like we achoo, release mm. Yo, know, all that wonderful yuck. <laughs> but the exudate that's being produced by the plant is a mixture of mostly sugars mm -hmm. from photosynthesis, a little bit of protein typically, and a perhaps some um, car carbohydrate. So there are literally billions of different kinds of exudates that a plant could produce in mm -hmm. order to wake up the specific bacterial species that it needs to do a job or the specific fungal species that that plant needs to do a job for the plant. And so the plant is putting out messages mm, just okay. because you and I as human beings have never recognized that that's how plants speak to bacteria and fungi is to release these exudates. That's exactly what they're doing. It's a message to say, hey, you, that it's going to make the phosphatase in order for me to get the phosphorus I need. Wake up. I need you to make that <laughs> enzyme and go out and gather me some phosphate. But that's exactly what the fungus or the bacterium does. It, it does exactly what the plant, because the, the little bacterium knows that if I'm good mm. and I make what the plant needs, the plant's going to send some more my way. Nice. I, I've got a corner on this market. Nobody else can touch it. <laughs> so they make the enzyme, pull that nutrient into their biomass, and now they're storing that nutrient for the plant. Hmm. So sooner or later, the plant knows that it's got lots and lots of bacteria around the root system. Oh yeah, protecting the root from diseases and pests got lots of those bacteria that's going to attract the predators of the bacteria and fungi to come into that root system. Mm. And they eat some of the bacteria, some of the fungi, just enough to keep the balances right. If the, if the plant sees like uh, your uh, predators, you're eating too much, mm. um, the plant's going to put out more food to grow more bacteria and fungi. So mm. the balance is maintained. Okay. Yeah. Like a given pole. Take right. That. So come on, guys, come on into the root system, eat some of the bacteria and fungi. Sorry, guys, you know, but <laughs> you, you have only about 600 million brothers and sisters oh my <laughs> in my root system. So losing a couple of you, it's not going to be that big a deal. But when a protozoan that eats bacteria or a bacterial feeding nematode eats bacteria, mm -hmm it's going to have way too high a concentration of nutrients in the fungus or in the bacterium. The carbon nitrogen ratio of a bacterium is five carbons for every one nitrogen. Mm. There is no organism higher concentration mm. in any of these nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, iron, zinc, all of those nutrients than bacteria. Mm. Fungi come in second as mm -hmm. being highest in those nutrients. So when the predator eats a bacterium or a fungus, the concentration of nutrients is way too high mm -hmm. for those predators. So they poop or release mm -hmm. those nutrients in a plant available form. Interesting. 
right next to the root, right there, right next oh, to the man. root. So the plant goes, thanks, pizza delivery guy. You delivered it <laughs> right to my door. Very good. Now I need these other sets of nutrients or I need more of these nutrients and I'll go the exudates to keep this job, keep this business up and going. So we do not ever want bare soil anywhere. Right. Right. Because if you've got bare soil, where's the food to keep the good guys growing? Hmm. Who's going to come along and colonize bare soil? Right. The, right. the bad guys pretty much is all that's going to be living in there. Hmm. And now you've got hmm, dirt. Yeah. You don't have any of the diversity of the beneficial organisms especially if we start applying pesticides because gosh, we've got all kinds of weeds coming up. So we better put herbicides out there. Mm. The herbicides, all of them kill the beneficial organisms in the soil. It depends on how toxic they are, how badly your food web is going to be affected. But there is absolutely no reason to be putting out these toxic chemicals to try to deal with diseases and pests and problem organisms, mm -hmm. we need to be putting out the right sets of organisms and maintaining the conditions in the soil such that your plant is going to grow really well. Right. It takes a year typically okay. to establish all of this. Okay. So, you know, we, the, we've put the compost out last fall, or maybe we put it out in the spring. Maybe we'll put on an application of liquid compost mm -hmm. called extract. And then the above ground part of the plant is those leaves get growing. We're going to apply a compost tea because we want the organisms in that tea to be growing really, really rapidly. Mm -hmm. And they make them the glues that allows them to stick instantly to the surface of anything that they contact. Okay. So we want those organisms gluing themselves to that organic matter. And right. oh yeah, it's organic matter that they stick to. If you're growing these things in a plastic um, um, a, a fermenter, or excuse me, a plastic brewer, sorry, mm -hmm. they don't stick to the surfaces of the plastic all that well. You've gotta be doing some things really, really wrong okay. to have stuff starting to stick to the inside of the tank. So those organisms are really looking for organic matter. Mm -hmm. So when you apply it to the soil surface and that water starts to move through, these organisms are gluing themselves to the surfaces of the organic matter and maybe the sands, the silts and clays, rocks and pebbles as well. Mm -hmm. So we want to inoculate all of those things in there. Now we want all of those higher level predators that run around in soil where we've got real active living bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, et cetera, running around. They're now gonna climb up the stem of your plant, inoculating the stem of your plant with all of these beneficial organisms. They're gonna walk mm. out onto your leaves and colonize the leaf surface. And oh yeah, they've got the ability to walk on the underside as well. Wow. And everywhere they wander, they will leave behind these really beneficial organisms that okay. will prevent diseases and pests and problem organisms from <clears throat> finding those leaves in the first place. So how do like flies and insects know that there is beneficial organisms there? Can they see it or smell it or how do they? Probably smell that? it. Okay. Yep. So there's a lot of um, very small amounts of gases that are produced, okay. and those are very unique signals. Like VOCs so, or? Yep. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Um, different kinds of, uh, those, of gaseous products, or okay. maybe the leaf itself has a um, taste, a flavor to it. Oh. So okay. where, you know, or in the soil, those organisms are eating the bacteria and the fungi. They're eating the predators, so they're eating protozoa, they're eating the nematodes, they're eating the microarthropods, the incatraeids, maybe even some earthworms. Mm -hmm. you know, think about birds yeah. hopping along on the surface of the soil looking for mm -hmm. earthworms. Mm -hmm. And then they fly from the soil up to your the branch in your tree Well, they're inoculating mm -hmm. all the beneficials. So think about all the flying anything 
Yeah. That will land on the soil. You want them to be picking up a load of really good organisms, not this sick, horrible diseases and pests and problem organisms, mm -hmm. which is what you're going to get if you're putting on pesticides or herbicides or mm -hmm. nematicides or anything, any of the acidal yeah. things whose function is to kill stuff. Right. There is no pesticide that kills just one species of organisms might be able to affect the you know mildew or affect the phytophthora or, you know some of those mm -hmm. other downy mildews and things like that but it's also going to kill way more of the beneficial organisms than it's going to kill of the bad guys mm -hmm. so let's do control of the diseases and pests the way mother nature has been controlling diseases and pests for something like the last 3.5 billion years. She's been doing this for a billion years. <laughs> so when it comes to your plant, your plants, rooted plants appeared about a billion years ago mm. on this planet. And nature has been preventing diseases from wiping those plants out by having the right kinds of beneficial organisms in the soil. Mm. You know, if you believe the people who say, well, you can't grow plants without fertilizers, they're, they have never paid attention to Mother Nature because <laughs> she's only been doing that for the last billion years. Right. Think about an old growth forest. Yeah. How they long are, have that. those, yeah. How <laughs> long have those trees been growing? Oh, 2000 years. <laughs> so why haven't they run out of nutrients in the soil? Because those nutrients are replenished mm -hmm. on a daily basis in your soil. And it is the bacteria and fungi using their enzymes to make those rocks, those pebbles, those, mm, you know, parent material, boulders. Mm -hmm. To They're slowly but surely de um, co decomposing them using the acids and using the enzymes that those organisms make. So they're releasing sand, salt, and clay. Right. So your bacteria and your fungi can go, oh, my plant sent me a message that said you, she needs more boron. So I'm going to whip out the, where's, where's the manual? Okay, this is how <laughs> I make, um, you know, boron enzymes. Okay, now I'm a little of this, a little of that, a little of the thing. And I will release that out into the soil. It'll go out there and convert some of the crystalline structure mm. of your sand, silts, and clays and pull the boron out and mm -hmm. just the boron and pulls it the bacteria have these things on a long string basically <laughs> pull it back into the cell and stores it in the cell so I that the visualization of that <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yep and so the fungi same sort of thing mm -hmm. it gets the message it puts out the enzymes but the fungi are a little different they will actually release the enzymes into the soil and then as the fungus grows along and is branching out uh it will pick up those nutrients that have been prepared for them Ooh. as they go through the soil wow. so kind of a different strategy on yeah. the two different kinds of organisms yeah how have you been like measuring this um like in a lab setting or yeah how do you we will, if we don't have the money to do um, radioactive labeled materials, mm -hmm. um, we'll have controls where we are sterilizing the soil and, um, and then add in the inorganic fertilizers um, because, you know, that's supposed to be where your plant is getting its nutrients from. Mm -hmm. And so we see how well those plants grow. What is the tissue concentration of nitrogen or phosphorus or sulfur, magnesium, things like that. And then we compare that to plants that are, we sterilize the soil. We then added all the right mi microorganisms. So we're up in it. We're trying to get all of those species of bacteria and fungi and protozoa and nematodes back into that soil. Um, put the same seed that's been traded exactly the same way. Um, and then look at how this plant grows compared to the chemically treated. And we can see things like increases in yields of um, 50 to 75 percent, wow, yeah. up to 100 percent, 300 percent. There are places that we've gotten a thousand fold increase in production. 
with the biological side as compared to the chemical. Right. Now, sometimes during growing seasons, it's hard to get the plant to reach its genetic potential mm -hmm. because the weather is not mm -hmm. cooperating. Right. You know, it's a cold summer. We've never seen the sun. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's hard to grow highly productive anything. Right. But right. the biological side, if done properly, where you're really paying attention to the organisms, we always have an increase in yield mm -hmm. as compared to the chemical system. Right. Hmm. So let's talk about like the trophic levels and how that uh, pertains to that. Like if you were to take one category out, how does that affect the whole uh, food web? Yep. And so you've, you've got to kind of understand the relationships. Mm -hmm. So here's the plant putting out the exudates. Here are the bacteria and fungi doing the job of pulling nutrients and storing it, retaining it. And so that's a very important role of bacteria and fungi is to hold the nutrients. So there is no leaching. Mm -hmm. There is no loss by runoff of any of those soluble nutrients. It's not until the bacteria and fungi get eaten by their predators, the bacteria, the protozoa, the bacterial feeding nematodes, the microarthropods, um, they eat the bacteria and fungi, releasing those nutrients in a plant available form. The plant takes up what it needs. Any excess it, that's left behind is going to be eaten by the bacteria and fungi that didn't get eaten by the predators. <laughs> okay. But you can see where it's really important to keep the balance of the number of predators mm -hmm. with the number of bacteria and fungi. You, you better keep that balance because if the predators start getting too numerous, mm -hmm. they're going to overeat all those bacteria and fungi. And now you, now you're back to dirt again. Right. You don't have the biology that you need. So how do you control those predators that are eating the bacteria and fungi? That means you've got to have your next trophic level. You've got to have those bigger critters, the mm -hmm. macro arthropods. You've got to have earthworms. You've got to have the bigger spiders, for example, that will now eat those protozoa, those right. nematodes, those microarthropods to keep the balance. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you keep these guys in control? Because if they overeat the predators, then all your nutrients are going to end up in the bacteria and fungi, and your plant's not going to get what it needs. Right. So right. you better have another trophic level that keeps this, that third trophic level under control, that keeps the second um, properly balanced, that keeps the bacteria and fungi properly balanced. So your plant's going to get the benefit that it requires. Hmm. As you go through that trophic level, you get to the, all the above ground critters. And who's at the top of our food web? It's Us. human beings. Yeah. We're the ones that are in control of this. We're supposed to be the gardeners of this planet. That does not mean you extract all the possible nutrition and throw it away. Mm -hmm. um, you can't be doing that if we want to have successive generations of human beings and all of the animals that are associated with us we are going to lose all of that mm -hmm. if we don't stop using the toxic chemicals in what we're growing yeah. now does that does that mean that we have to tomorrow stop using all inorganic fertilizers all pesticides no, no it doesn't mm -hmm. because we've got to have at least that first year where things are getting back into shape the balances are being achieved we might have to use some toxic chemical in order to control something. But then as soon as you've applied that toxic chemical, what you want to do is come out and apply all of those organisms that you killed mm -hmm. when you use that toxic chemical. Mm -hmm. So in order to save your plants against some plague that's coming through, okay, you use the chemicals. Okay. And what you find out is that the chem those chemicals, you can use way less right. of those chemicals because the effect that they have is that much stronger. So reduce the amount of chemical. Don't use it unless you absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. And of course, the way we figure that one out is to use our microscopes. Okay. What, what's the biology in your soil? Is it out? Is it in balance or is it out of balance? Right. So you go and add the missing organism that you need. And if you're constantly making good compost, 
then you have that constant supply of all these really beneficial organisms. So you can now add what's missing mm. to your soil. Interesting. Um, so how can us humans help uh, the soil food web? We can stop killing it. <laughs> um, stop putting out inorganic fertilizers. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there is no soil on this planet that lacks the nutrients to grow your plants. And so when you get your soil chemistry report back and your advisor saying, oh, you don't have any nitrogen in your soil, your nitrate levels are down at 0.1 parts per million. That's completely inappropriate mm. because that is not the total nutrient that's in that soil. That's mm. the total soluble inorganic nutrient right. that's in your soil. Right. And what we really need to know is total. Right. Okay. And if you looked at nitrogen in most soil, the concentration of nitrogen in that soil is up around 2,000 parts per million. And your crops only need maybe one to three mm. parts per million. Okay. So how many hundreds of years of nutrients do you have stored in your soil? Wow. It's immense. And then remember the bacteria and fungi are breaking down the rocks, the pebbles, the parent material, the boulders, et cetera, mm -hmm. every second of every day, mm -hmm. they're breaking those things down. So your soil is constantly being improved oh, sure. by getting more sand, silt, and clay that contains more nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, so a little bit of the whole list. <laughs> so <laughs> so you, we don't have to be putting inorganic fertilizers down. Mm -hmm. But then somebody in the audience, you know, some wise ass back there says, well, but I went out and looked at my plants and they weren't doing very well. So I put on nitrogen fertilizer and they immediately started growing. What do you say to that? Mm. Well, Mother Nature is trying to send you a message. The message being that there's something wrong with your soil. You do not have the organisms to do the nutrient cycling for your plant. And so the only way you can get that nutrition into your plant is to put on an inorganic soluble nutrient. Mm. Except that now, what have you done to that whole food web? Mm. You just took it down. Yep. So now who's going to be protecting your root system? Who's going to be protecting the above ground part of your plant? Who's going to be cycling the nutrients for the next round? Let's see, your plant's going to start running out of nutrition about, oh, 10 seconds from now. Mm. And what does that do to your plant health? What does right. that do to your yields right. if the nutrients are not there anymore? Mm. So really, when you put on an inorganic fertilizer and your plant responds, you need to read that correctly. Mm. You ought to look at that and go, uh-oh, I'm missing something in the soil. And I better get my microscope out and I better figure out who's not there. Is it the bacteria that have gotten whacked and are no longer capable of pulling the nutrients into their bodies so something can eat them and release those nutrients? Is it the fungi that have been wiped out? What if it's the protozoa? What if it's the nematodes? Well, your bacteria and fungi are just getting fatter and happier every single second. No way to cycle those nutrients back into a plant available form. Mm. So your plant starts going, hey, I have sen been sending messages. I have been putting out those exudates and nobody's paying any attention to me. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do it anymore because you won't listen to me. Mm. So, you know, when we're out there destroying those things, we're causing a hissy fit right. to happen in our, well, it's dirt now mm. instead of soil. Mm. Hans Jenny, the father of soil science, defines soil as containing the sand, the silt, the clay, the mineral particles mm -hmm. that are not leachable. They don't leave the system because they are so tied up in the structure, uh, the crystalline structure of the sand, silt, clays, rocks, and pebbles, et cetera. And so then you also need organic matter. So you don't want to be burning everything in your field. You don't want to be, you know, somehow taking up all of the residues and putting it someplace else. Right, right. You want those residues to decompose and turn into soil. Well, what causes decomposition? Yeah, it's bacteria and fungi. Mm -hmm. So if you've been putting out 
pesticides, you've been putting out inorganic fertilizers, you've been killing those organisms. Mm -hmm. So you must have the organic matter out there as well. And then you need the organisms to actually to do all the work. All the work in soil comes from the food web performing in its various functions. When we want structure built in the soil, we've got to get the bacteria and fungi making those glues and gluing micro aggregates, little tiny ones that the bacteria are running around having a good old time or the fungi are gonna take their strands and pull all those micro aggregates together, bind them into the larger aggregates that you can see quite mm -hmm. often with your own eyes. And so you know that structure's being built. That means water is gonna infiltrate into your soil at a nice speed, not too slow, not too fast. And you're gonna keep all that water in your soil so you don't have to irrigate. Mm -hmm. At the end of that dry summer period, you've got plenty of water stored down there at you know four feet, five feet, six feet. Will your root systems be able to get down there? Absolutely. Well, right. as long as you haven't compacted your soil. Right. What is the difference um, with like the height too? Um, like more of the top would be more fungus, or and then bacteria is more at the bottom, or how does that differ? And Height. What we what we see when we look at the whole root system mm -hmm. is that balance of fungi and bacteria does not change. Okay. As we go from the top down to the bottom. Now the A horizon right. is where all the plant residue material fell last mm -hmm. fall and hopefully got converted into soil. So you have really good levels of nutrients. So lots of the nutrients for your plant does come from that that place. But then there are things like the boron, the manganese, the magnesium, some of the micronutrients that your plant really needs roots going down deeper into the soil because there's more of those kinds of nutrients okay. deeper down in the profile. Right. And you want those root systems growing down to summer water. Okay. Where the plant can you know, pull up all of that water and you don't have to now pay somebody mm -hmm. to deliver that water chock full of chlorine and chloramine um, yep. to water your plants with. Mm. So your plants will do better even if you all you do is put humic acid into your um, city water to complex those humics and fulvics. Mm. Interesting. Yep. What is your take on um, people raking up their leaves and taking them out, out of the yard? <laughs> you're, you're, you're asking to have to use inorganic fertilizers, you know, it's sort of like, we're going to spend money so we can spend more money. Right. This is just nonsensical. <laughs> Make a compost pile. Um, and you know, if you if you can't do the um, thermal compost pile, then you do a worm compost pile. Mm -hmm. You know, pile your leaves in some particular place, make sure that you've got lots of good earthworms in them, mm -hmm. and just let them go. Um, I often will take my uh, food waste from my house mm -hmm. and go put a nice light layer of that food waste on top of that um, worm pile the worms okay, come yeah. up to the surface they will chow down on that plant material well actually what the earthworm is doing it it take if this is the earthworm it takes a bite mm -hmm. so there there's some organic matter it takes a bite out of that and rips it off so now that bite of um, organic matter is in here and what the earthworms actually after are the bacteria the fungi the protozoa the nematodes the microarthropods that are growing on that bite. Oh. That bite goes into the crop, essentially right. the same, like the gizzard on a yep. chicken. And what that does is it's a set of muscles that compress mm -hmm. and try to break open all the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, and all that mm -hmm. internal juice is mm -hmm. what comes out. And that's what the earthworm takes up. Okay. Not and actually it relaxes sense. that muscle. And so the next bite comes along and pushes all the other bites further oh, down. So then the worm contracts again mm -hmm. and tries to crush other individuals that didn't get crushed in the first time. And mm. so what the earthworm is getting is the juice out of all of those organisms as it's going down the body of the earthworm. Wow. And then 
that material is going to get released out into a chamber that is the back part of the earthworm, where it's just a massive culture mm. that grows all the best kinds of bacteria and fungi, very aerobic, because the worm is an obligately aerobic organism. Right. It cannot survive anaerobic conditions of right. any kind. You ever want to watch a scared earthworm? Let something go anaerobic in your compost pile oh. and the worms just go, let me out of here. That's why you um, see like worms on the ground when it's raining because they're trying to get. Yeah, because typically their, their burrows mm -hmm. have gotten completely filled with water. Okay, yep. And it doesn't have enough oxygen in it. Right. So the earthworm has to come up to the surface. It, it's looking around for a place to hide out so the mm -hmm. birds won't get it. So human beings won't step on it, all those good things. And, you know, if when it makes the mistake and crawls onto your sidewalk, mm -hmm. the um, material that concrete is made from leaches a great deal of, of highly um, um, salty uh, materials. Oh, wow. That's what's killing your earthworm on the tarmac mm -hmm. on the road or uh, on your sidewalk or sunlight. When the sun wow, yeah. comes up, the, some of the experts on in the world uh, that work with earthworms say that uh, um, earthworm can only tolerate 15 seconds of direct sunlight. Wow. And then it's bound for death. Wow. It's, it's conditions of it's you know so That's still i put my, those back into the compost pile mm -hmm. because then as it decomposes the other right. earthworms get all those nutrients right wow. so that really good set of microorganisms in its rear end mm -hmm. um and as they're doing and releasing materials the earthworm gets that juice now mm -hmm. and so it's a different set of my micronutrients that it's requiring and then once it's done processing all of that, it compresses the cast, that semi-solid material, mm -hmm. along with all of these organisms, the really most beneficial organisms, and releases that wonderful inoculum with the foods out into the worm bin. Wow. And so your worm That's compost is made up of that hugely. When we, you know, they, people will say, well, we can do the DNA analysis of earthworm poop mm -hmm. and what they find is something like 75 percent of the dna that they're looking at we have no idea wow. we've never found that microorganism ever before on oh. the surface of this planet and it's wow. just how little we know wow um, you know Maybe two or three kills. Two or three thousand species of bacteria, and that's just bacteria. Never mind yeah. fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. Um, in that little worm cast, that what a treasure trove mm -hmm. of all the different species that your plants might need in any particular growing season. Because we all know growing seasons are always different. Mm -hmm. I don't think any growing season has ever repeated itself. Right. Right. That anywhere. Makes sense. So you've got to have this huge diversity of all these organisms. Right. You can't be adding back in just one or two species. Right. It drives me crazy when Bayer, for example, you know, they took over Monsanto and now Bayer yep, is starting yep. to make the noises that Monsanto used to make. Here they have a container in the, in the store and it says there are two very strong bacteria in this inoculum. <laughs> very strong. <laughs> Does that mean like it's got bad breath or something? It's got BO, you know, what, what, what do you mean? Yeah. Very strong. I don't yeah. want very strong bacteria because they're going to take over and try to rule right. the roost. Just to. Gonna, yeah. Wipe out all the others. And so the next time my soil reaches 55 degrees, mm -hmm. those very strong two species of bacteria are going to all die. Mm because they don't tolerate high temperatures right. or they don't tolerate it really dry. They don't tolerate whatever. Right, right. That's why you should have diversity. That's okay. why we need that. Well, we need a million species of bacteria per woodlot. Mm, okay. So, yeah, yep. And then, incredible. you know, we need, we need a million bacteria. We should have half a million different species of fungi. We should have a quarter of a million different species of protozoa. We should have about um, 10,000 million 
um whatever yeah so what is that in like biomass like the but like the weight of that in that lot um it it depends on how how disturbed the mm -hmm. area is the more you disturb the more you wipe out that biology in the soil right and so like most agronomists think that the bacteria fungi protozoa and nematodes or the food web mm -hmm. is somewhere around one to five percent okay. of the weight of a, of soil okay okay if you go to the most productive ecosystems on this planet for mm -hmm. example the old growth cedar groves on the olympic peninsula in the state of washington and you dig into that soil mm -hmm. 75 percent of the weight of that volume of soil that you picked up 75 percent is fungal hyphae wow now think about bacteria in there and now yeah. protozoa and nematodes and microarthropods that soil is pure organic matter yeah there's no sandstone clay in there yeah and yet look at what it's growing wow. some of the biggest tallest most productive trees on the planet yeah you know the the tree rings on those plants are really wide year after year after year after year they're putting on more they're tying up in nutrition mm -hmm. in the rings of wood that they're making right they're tying up more nutrient than any agricultural field on the planet you take all your tomatoes and you um, haul them off to market oh you're you've taken all that nitrogen off you've taken all that phosphorus you're going to have to use an inorganic fertilizer and replace it Eh, wrong <laughs> what's going on is every second of every day the bacteria and fungi are chowing down on the sand silk to make more sand silk and clay from the rocks and pebbles and everything mm -hmm. there is no lack of nutrients in your soil what you lack is the biology to convert those nutrients into a plant available form perfectly you, said you don't want to have those soluble inorganic nutrients wandering around in your soil mm -hmm. very long or they'll leach or they'll get blown off mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we've got to have the bacteria and fungi there to take up whatever your plant doesn't use yeah and how can somebody if they have their own farm or garden how can somebody um like calculate what they have in their soil and how to yeah yep we teach them we teach them how to use a microscope okay you know most of the time farmers don't really have to know that they've got um 10.35 billion bacteria per gram of soil they they don't need to know the exact number like that mm -hmm. so what we like to do with farmers is we give them a series of pictures okay if your bacteria look like mm -hmm. this just one or two in there Okay, all you've got is, uh, uh, and if this is your one to five dilution, you're in trouble. Uh oh. <laughs> so you better be putting some more bacteria in there just as rapidly as you can. Make a tea, make an extract, get it out there, put it through the irrigation system, whatever. You know, if you've got a goodly number of bacteria, yeah, this is what we want to see. Then great, you, you don't have to fuss. Now we look at, oh my God. There's nothing but bacteria in here. It's just massive. I can't see anything else because this massive bacteria is just blocking everything out. Mm -hmm. You're in trouble. Okay. Um, you, you've got to get this balance, especially if you're trying to grow row crops or if you're trying to grow carrots or right. uh, tomatoes or something or, you know, um, vine, grapevines or right. whatever. Yeah. So, we we can give people simple ways where they don't have to try to measure the length of the fungal hypha or measure the diameter um, we teach people who are going to become lab techs that mm -hmm. might do those kinds of um, processes or do those assessments of what the biology is in soil for people who don't want to learn to use a microscope you mm -hmm. can uh, you know convince one of your neighbors that they should do this for the community oh. and teach everybody um, to come and, and bring their samples to that person. They'll make a good living, but then everybody gets improvements 
in the way their plants are growing. Mm. And think about if you don't have to buy inorganic fertilizer, could right. you save some money? <laughs> yeah. uh, how about if you didn't have to buy a pesticide to get rid of um, you know, the, the fungus gnats or the mm -hmm. white flies or the aphids? What if you didn't have to buy a fungicide to try to get rid of the fungal diseases? And joyfully, most fungal diseases have now become resistant to whatever fungicide we're trying to use. Right. They've all developed resistance. So what do you do to get rid of fusarium? There is nothing mm -hmm. that you can buy that will kill fusarium. So what are you supposed to do? Get the biology back in your soil. Because Mother Nature has a trillion different ways to attack fusarium. Hmm. All these different mechanisms. So if the fusarium becomes resistant to this one approach, um, she's in there with a hundred different biological approaches. And it's really hard to gain resistance hmm. to biology because there's so diff many different mechanisms that are out there that we will find somebody to take care of your problems for you. Nice. Um, so if somebody doesn't want to use like microscopy, could you also look at the soil and see uh, texture or color? Could that be an indicator of yep. organisms? Those are, those are good indicators uh, in general. Mm -hmm. you know, so if you, you know, put your hands into the soil and smell it, first mm -hmm. of all, it should smell like a good, rich forest soil. Okay. Um, and then when you've got it in your hands, kind of give it a little shake. Yeah. And you can see that there are airways and passages, passageways. Mm. You can see that there's all kinds of ways for air and oxygen and water microorganisms to wander around in here. Mm -hmm. That's a good sign that that's going to be a highly productive soil. Okay. Um, you know, so nice, rich, dark brown color is what we want to see when we're dealing with good soil or good compost. Mm -hmm. And so think of 70% um, cocoa chocolate. Okay. Yep. That's the color that you wanna see. Um, and I always think of it as, that's my favorite uh, hot chocolate recipe in the morning. Yes. That's the color I want my <laughs> I soil. And, my, and it, if you're dealing with something that's black in color, mm -hmm. um, that's a really good environment for growing the bad guys. Right putrefied right. organic matter and, smells and you're gonna and... smells bad it's kind of oily it's got a mm. you know it's, that's not a good sign i know there are people out there in the organic world that say oh this is evidence of a really good um compost mm -hmm. no it's not because <laughs> typically you've got some really bad organisms growing in there you put that anywhere near the root system of a plant and i don't think the plant's going to make it through mm. the rest of the growing season mm. so we've got to get some of that misinformation out right there, or at the very least you'd want to look at that material using your microscope to determine if there are bad guys in right. there or not right. that's really the final has the final say is look through the microscope mm -hmm. see whether you've got good bacteria good fungi protozoa nematodes you don't want to see any retreating nematodes. You want to see all of the other kinds. And we treat, teach people how to recognize okay. uh, very simply. Okay. Now, all root feeding nematodes have this great big spear typically in their mouth with some knobs on it. Mm. Highly indicative of mm. the root feeding nematodes. So you don't want to be seeing any of those. Right. Go. Um, and you, you're saying uh, we teach. So can you actually explain a little bit? I know you have a soil food web school, which I, I'm so interested in hearing about this. So, yep. So over the last 45 years, I've been developing lots of um, teaching um, materials. I have gone out and given uh, workshops for um, five days long workshop with maybe a, you know, the last, a, a sixth day for doing just microscope work. Um, and so we've um, taken videos of mm -hmm. all of those classes so that it can, it's online now. So the foundation courses, we have, there are four foundation courses. In the first one, we go over all of the background information, the theory, the, here's what you have to know, a lot of what we've been talking about here this mm -hmm. morning where we're talking about the food web, what is that? Uh, how does, um, how was the balance on the food web have to be 
-hmm. for the kind of plant that you're growing. You've got to get it lined up with where in succession is a plant I want to grow. And that tells me what that fungal to bacterial ratio needs to be. And then you get to try to, and the, and the joyful thing about this is you don't have to get it to exactly 135 right. and 130 as long as you've got it balanced. Okay. So, um, you know, we do give some minimum numbers. We want it at least 135 mm -hmm. or more okay. and then balanced properly. So, and, you know, like, well, what if my soil is, has um, 350 and here's my bacteria at 375. Mm -hmm. Fine, close enough. Mm -hmm. The plant will now work to get exactly what the plant wants. Nice. So all those great exudates coming out are going to be doing even more. Mm -hmm. Trying to get the balance the way that plant, that cultivar of that plant wants to see in the soil around its root system. So what was the question again? I keep going uh, off on your, your uh, school that you have. I think you're on the first uh, foundation. foundation course. Yep. yep. So there are actually about 27 lectures okay. in that first foundation course. Each of them are about 45 minutes long. Mm -hmm. In the second, we talk about making compost. And so lots of um, help in terms of uh, what's the carbon and nitrogen ratio? You don't have to be exactly precise about it. In general, that's again, you know, you can do simple calculations. We want, um, we've got a re recipe that everybody starts here and then starts to realize that with your starting materials, you're going to add a little bit different percentages of the green, the high nitrogen, and the woody materials. Mm -hmm. So we go through that. How do you turn it? Here's the thought process behind that. This is why we do things. I always want to have a solid reason for doing something. Mm -hmm. I think it's totally unacceptable to say, well, we just do that because. Right. Right. That's, that's like your whole thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> not science. Uh, we've got to have solid science behind everything that we do. Not that we know everything yet. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be times in classes where we're going to go, we don't understand why this is right. working that way. And yep, we've got, we've got more to learn. So don't <laughs> imagine for a second that we've got all the answers. Right. Um, there's about eight or nine lectures in the compost course. Um, in the compost tea and extract, that's uh, foundation course number three. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing there, there aren't uh, very many um, different lectures or different sections, mm -hmm. uh, but um, we kind of make up in length a little bit what we, you know, we're not going to do 27 lectures for you um, because we're done with the topic typically. And we're teaching you how to do hands-on where you can watch and see what we do on screen mm -hmm. and you can go do it yourself that way. Cool. And then the third, the fourth course is the microscope, learning to use the microscope. Okay. And we go through looking at things in that very general way. Right. You know, here are the pictures. Now compare what you're seeing through the microscope mm -hmm. with those pictures. And so you can tell that it's this concentration of bacteria so you can calculate what you have for bacteria and fungi and protozoa and nematodes. Okay. Um, we're working on um, doing that similar sort of thing for the microarthropods. Okay. Not quite finished with it, but hopefully sometime next fall, mm -hmm. we'll have that completed. And now we can all add the microarthropods uh, right. identification. Do you have the right ones or do you have the ones that are telling you yeah. <laughs> the bad guys are winning? <laughs> Yeah. So how do we fix that then? Yeah. So huh. then once, if you want to go on and you want to become a lab tech for somebody else where you're going to be really um, very dedicated to precision mm -hmm. and accuracy of your microscope work, you take the CLP. So it's okay. um, for a lab technician. Mm -hmm. And um we always have people put up their names on our um, picture of the world about where are they located, and we will help send people to oh, you. Oh wow, that's really to, cool. Yeah, so it's it's an advertising program. We're expecting people to also 
go out and talk to all their grower groups, go talk to all the master gardeners and all of the, you know, everyone you can think of that has a, a club or a group mm -hmm. that they are trying to do the best they can at hydroponics because right. everything we do applies to hydroponics. You, you don't have to have sand silt or clay mm -hmm. in your soil. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's because most of the planet's surface is right. covered by sand, silt, and clay. That's where we're going to grow things in it. Okay. Um, if you have just a rooftop garden, you're only mm -hmm. going to have organic matter because organic matter is light. Right. Well, then you need to have the organisms to do the cycling. And now you can have beautiful plant production mm -hmm. um, on rooftop gardens. Um, I, for many years, I worked with the person who uh, did all the rooftop gardens at the Rockefeller uh, building in downtown New York City. Ooh. And they didn't ever have to change out. They didn't have to rotate things. They didn't have any diseases or pests or problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the person who is taken the place, they just, they know everything yeah. about what they need to do. So awesome. they don't work with us all that much anymore because we solved all their problems yeah. for them. Yeah, which is nice to, nice yep. to hear. Because after a while, that's what you should do mm -hmm. is... You've got all the biology in place. It's all set up. It works all by itself because that's how Mother Nature designed it to right, work. Right. You don't have to keep messing with it. Mm -hmm. Once you get everything into place, you just check your soil, make sure everything's okay. You've got the biology. And then you do what every good farmer should do is go fishing for the rest of the summer. <laughs> yes. Has it been uh, hard to convince certain corporations to implement this or what's the struggle with that yeah the well think about who we're really up against we're up against some really um wealthy mm -hmm. um kinds of of businesses now think of all the pesticide companies um all of the you know genetically engineered um companies that want you to come and buy this engineered organism where you don't know what the reaction of that organism is going to be under conditions different from what they tested in the lab. Right, right. It's like an so, unknown like organism adding to your soil food web type of thing. Yep, and is it, wow. is it really gonna be a good guy or is it gonna mm. maybe be a bad guy? And once we've released these things out into the real world, you cannot get them back. Right, right. So it's like, okay, I guess if you want a death, death wish, mm. oh, then you should go ahead and, you know, what's the set of tests that they really have to do? Right. And if you start looking at some of the um, academics who've said, here's really the full course of testing genetically engineered organisms before you allow them to be released out into the real world. Right. We don't have yeah. enough money. Yeah. You could oh. not possibly afford those genetically engineered organisms. If we want to know that we're at least 75% reasonable prediction that they're not going to turn into something horrible mm. under some set of conditions. Yeah. So I want to see them testing more. Yeah. And yet the U.S. government, its standards in the, um, their regulations is that genetically engineered or organisms are of no greater risk than the parent. Mm. Oh my God. <laughs> How can they say that genetically yeah, engineered organisms are different enough to be patentable mm. and yet they're of right. no greater difference than the, yeah, I just. Yeah, this, that's suspicious. Yeah, this is. <laughs> bullshit yeah that you know much. that and if the american public would just please wake up because mm. once we get well look at the pandemic right once it got started in china mm -hmm. got over here there is no stopping it right once right. you release a microorganism out into the real world you are stuck with it yeah that's so, very true let's make sure those genetically engineered organisms aren't dangerous. Hmm. Very, very good. How do you think then climate change has been affecting the soil food web? Um, it's going to cause changes because now the conditions that select for 
any particular microorganism is not going to exist anymore here. It's now going to be up there along the road. Well, you know, when the microorganisms are being transferred by things that fly, the probability is they're going to get there long before the plant gets there. So anything specific to a plant that now the place where it was growing is no longer compatible with that plant. Mm -hmm. How do we get the plants to move 500 miles north right. where the climate is now correct for that plant? Plants right. don't move that fast. Right. They, they aren't carried 500 miles by a, a crow or a, you know, right. a, a robin or a lark. You know, how are you going to get how are you going to get the plants up there? Our mm -hmm. job then becomes we've got to move the plants up there. We probably also want to make sure that everybody, all the microorganisms made it up 500 right. miles north. <laughs> and then, you know, 10 years from now, we're going to have to move them another mm. 500 miles until we've got everything growing at the North Pole and the rest right. of the planet is this big desert. Oh, um, gosh. You know, or it's, you start playing out that scenario. And right. it's, we've got to get that carbon back into the soil from whence it came. Hmm. When you think about the Great Plains of the United States and the descriptions that the pioneers had of what the soil looked like, rich, dark brown, 70% cocoa chocolate color mm -hmm. to all of that soil and in places down deep into the soil, 20, 30, 50 or more feet into the depth of the planet was all this gorgeous, beautiful well, topsoil. Mm -hmm. It was the living compost that Mother Nature was making. So how much carbon was sequestered in that soil? Mm. And what did we, as Europeans, right. putting that under the plow, what have we done to all that great organic matter? Most of the Great Plains of the United States is at less than 1% wow. organic matter. When once upon a time you were looking at 10 feet, 20 feet of 100% organic matter. Oh my gosh. And that's what grew those incredible crops. Mm. Same thing in California. Right. The place where everyone um, settled was on the coast because the depth of soil there was incredible. Mm. You put your plant in, you turned around and you walked away and yeah. went finishing all summer long wow. because the soil was so fantastic. Mm -hmm. What have we done? We've taken that 100% organic material wow. and then it's now less than 1%. Wow. We're trying to grow plants in sand. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> What's the probability that there's going to be the nutrients that your body requires? Mm -hmm. What's the probability that your biome supposed to get replenished by the foods that you eat by what's on the surfaces should be these highly beneficial right. species so when you take a bite of that apple you bite a, some of that carrot you cut the melon up you mm -hmm. should have been inoculating every time mm -hmm. you cut all those surface organisms were pulled yeah. into the melon and inoculated the melon on the inside oh, so when you ate it, yeah, you got an inoculum of all the things that are supposed to be in your digestive system. Mm -hmm. So how wow. much have we destroyed that? When you think about everything in the grocery store has been gamma irradiated. Oh, wow. All of your fruits are perhaps they don't have any of the beneficial mm. organisms on them anymore. So how are you going to deal with um, a child that has nonstop diarrhea? Right. Um, you know, switching from totally constipated to totally um, diarrhea and back mm -hmm. again and, and never having any time with normal bowel movements. Mm. How do you prevent them from dying? You inoculate them with the fecal material of a healthy person. Right. Wow. Just don't ever lose that inoculum. Yeah. Or you're going to have to go back to this. Yeah. So wow. how do we get those really good organisms back into our digestive systems? Hmm. Yeah. We, well, that's a whole circle of. Of everything. insanity that yeah. you just. 
the real, you know, the green revolution was a trap mm. and we've walked into it. Arms open wide, completely blinded mm. about what we were doing. Right. Now right. that we realize how important that biology is, we, we, we've got to resuscitate everything that we've been destroying. We have to stop destroying, mm -hmm. which means you can only use toxic chemicals very carefully. Right. And you have to come in and inoculate again mm -hmm. as soon as possible to replenish the biology that was destroyed by using that toxic chemical. Hmm. Wow. So, Inorganic yeah. fertilizers shouldn't be allowed at all. <laughs> we'll start the movement. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you had unlimited resources, what research besides this would you want to look into more? Um, I'd like to understand how in all the different uh, bioregions on mm -hmm. the planet, what is the exact ratio of fungi and bacteria? What are the communities? Mm. What are the actual species of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods? Right. We've got to get there eventually. Um, we, we've got to get to the point where Dr. Bashir points okay, his yes, tricorder yes. at the, yep, so um, we know instantaneously. I want a little handheld mass spectrometer Ooh, that you, you point it at what you're going to buy in the grocery store. Oh. And it, you know, you get the reflectance back and it reads off, here are the nutrients in that carrot. Carrot. Oh my gosh, yes. And you get the little message that says, don't buy that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or it says, yay, you found a good one. Oh my gosh. Because then like, a, like a game. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, you're you're floating around looking for the best buy, but the mm -hmm. best buy is defined by the micronutrients. Right. Because then when you eat that carrot, you instantaneously feel feel full. Mm -hmm. Because your body's going, yes, you I supplied all the nutrition that I need. You only needed one bite. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that'd be so cool. Who's going to be that yourself? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're not all the people in the uh, in the United States that are couch potatoes and are horribly overweight. Mm -hmm. And really, it's through no fault of their own. Right. They just have been told to eat the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And when they do start eating vegetables and greens, it doesn't have the biology on it that you need to have uh, yeah. to satisfy your, your urges. So you keep eating the potato chips, you keep mm -hmm. eating the pretzels and all of the things that do you no good. Right. Because your body is saying, hungry, I'm hungry, feed right. me, feed me, feed me. <laughs> and you're not putting in anything that has the nutrition it requires. Right. So we should just grow our own uh, like herbs inside or... Yeah, what would you recommend people to start with to incorporate better uh, microorganisms? Yeah, the perennials are much easier to deal mm -hmm. with. Um, you just want to go for maximum um, fungal biomass as much as you can. Um, you know, go to someplace that, that grows mushrooms mm -hmm. and they have the blocks of spent mushroom waste material mm -hmm. and buy a block of each of their different kinds of fungal Mm -hmm. um, and take that home and just a pinch into each one of your pots Ooh. to inoculate that yeah. diversity of fungi, uh, then why not start making your own um, yeah. compost? If you're doing a worm bin, you can have something like that right underneath your, um, your sink. Mm -hmm. You have yeah. to be careful enough that you only put enough food on the top layer of that worm bin Mm. So that the worms come up and incorporate all of it right. into the worm material. Right. You don't want so too you never have white flies or fungus gnats uh -huh. or fruit flies or anything. That's what the problem is. You overfeed your worm bin. Okay. And the worms don't take care of the problem fast right. enough. Right. So, you know, outside, it's really easy to do worm mm -hmm. um piles outside because you, you put out, well, you know, more or less what it takes them three days to eat mm. and let them go to work. And if you're giving them a good amount of food, the worms start multiplying. And so they start using up your food waste even faster. Mm. Okay. So pretty soon you've got that balance 
of how much food waste are you producing relative to the number of worms in your pile. And it, it's just automatic. It's a mm -hmm. chore that you just do. Mm -hmm. um, it, you just take what you've accumulated. The problem comes when you get to Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner. And now you've had 25 people over for dinner <laughs> and you've got food waste out the right. door. So you take the extra, you stick it in a plastic bag, you know, put the Ziploc on the top and put it in your freezer. Yep. Yep. And then you can slowly but surely parcel it out to the worms mm. as needs be. That's a good, that's some good advice. Yep. Like You're not that. stuck overfeeding your pile and causing all kinds of problems for a certain period of time. Right. Right. Uh, would you, what kind of advice would you give your younger self if you could go back? Uh, there, there would be some warnings about some people oh, who okay. try to kind of take advantage mm. of the fact that I'm not a business person. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on the research. I want to focus on helping people get all this right biology back into the soil so they don't have to work so hard. Right. And they don't have to buy expensive, toxic things mm -hmm. in order to grow those plants. Um, let's grow some fish at the same time as you grow these plants because aquaponics works mm. really well. Right, um, right. You know, you you have your lettuces, you have your tomatoes, and what you don't actually consume from those plants, you would turn that into fish food. Mm. And I like that. So you're feeding your fish, you're feeding yourself. You just have to make sure that you've got good biology in the little um, pots that you're growing the plants in, or their roots are hanging down into the water, and you're applying a mix, a, a liquid form. Mm -hmm. of the compost to that so the root systems of your plants get all colonized with all these great microorganisms and you've got the nutrient cycling going mm -hmm. you don't have to be putting oh, it drives me crazy when people in hydroponics oh you've got to go out and measure this 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 and this every hour mm -hmm. and because you've got to maintain the chemistry just oh, like this I see that's it's insane. Like, <laughs> that's um, way too much work. <laughs> yeah, way too much work. And what are you actually getting into your plants? Right. All that indicator stuff is part of what's going into your plant. And right. do, you, do you really want to eat that? Right, right. So how healthy is aquaponically raised food if they're doing it all chemically? Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Yeah, I have worries there. Me and my you know, mass, handheld mass spec going around and checking out how good is there. There you go. That would come in handy so many times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My suspicion is you probably wouldn't want to buy that. Hmm. But, you know, of course, you can't actually say that until right, right. you've got the proof. Right. Um, how, how have you been staying motivated um, all these years? Oh, there's, there's always some cute new critter to oh. find. In the soil, I have not found everything yet. Okay. Um, so there's always new stuff. And like right now, we've got like 2,000 students going through the foundation courses right mm. now. And we have forums where they can get on and um, put a picture of what they're looking at. So um, I, the first thing I do in the morning when I, I get up is to go look at, at the um, forums and, oh, yes. and look at the pictures and go, I have never seen anything like that oh. before in my life. What could this be? That is well, exciting. you know, it looks like, well, it kind of looks like it could be a diatom mm -hmm. or maybe it's a testate amoeba or maybe, you know, uh, some kind of zooplankton. So you start getting out the books and you call your buddies and you, <laughs> you know, and finally somebody says, Elaine, that's pollen, silly woman. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know pollen had so many sizes oh, and shapes. Oh my gosh, and, I know. Yep. So, so many. it'll the day it becomes boring is when I can't find any more new organisms mm. that I've never seen before. Mm. So, and since we're now just starting on getting all the identification worked out mm -hmm. for doing the microscope work with the uh, microarthropods, there's a whole new oh. crew of critters that whole we get category. To, I love it. Yep. 
massive. Mm. Okay, and then when we get done with that, we can go on to the macro arthropods. Mm. And after we get done with that, then we can go on to the spiders. Mm. And that, so I don't think I have to worry about finding things to do Perfect. till I get 150 years old. <laughs> what does a typical day look like for you then? Um, typically, it's um, getting up and um, having meetings, um, mm -hmm. the, you know, working with folks, um, looking at over their pictures, looking at their data, mm -hmm. um, seeing how to interpret um, the different things that are being done. Um, I, we have lots of mentors that are um, working with um, the students going through. I, you know, the, the foundation courses are strictly automated. So you can go through the whole FC, um, except for putting up pictures of things that you um, don't know what they are and getting other people's help. Mm -hmm. on what, what are those organisms? You can pretty much do the FC, the foundation courses, um, on your own, at your own pace. Don't have to worry. Then when you get into doing the, the really quantitative microscope stuff, mm -hmm. um, it's really better if you work one-on-one -on -one with a mentor. Okay. Because there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of, okay, now look at this picture, see how it's all kind of ghosty, can't really get anything into focus really well. Mm -hmm. That means you got to mess with this and mm. this and this. Yep. And um, so now start tweaking. Uh, oh, no, no, you went too far. You went too far. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> <laughs> so now take a look at how you focused in and out, in and out. And, you know, we take them through right. all of those different things. Oh, wow. And then when you're learning how to interpret mm -hmm. um, your, um, the microscope work that you've done, um, your bacteria are too high. Okay, if your bacteria are too high, how do you get it rid of extra bacteria? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, don't put any more bacterial foods out there, please. <laughs> um, second thing is you've got to get higher. Um, protozoa or bacteria feeding nematodes. Mm -hmm. So now, which one do you want to increase in number? And right. think about all the different ways there are to do that, and then get those organisms out. And okay, have they brought the numbers of bacteria down to where you want them to to be? Oh, you brought them down too low. <laughs> you put too many bacterial feeding nematodes into your soil. Okay, so now what's the next step? So we go through. Okay, a lot of troubleshooting. Some, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, figuring out what's wrong. Because of course, if things are going right, you're growing without pesticides. You're growing without the need for the inorganic fertilizers. Right. So how do you tell whether you need inorganic fertilizer? Right. Well, you put a little inorganic fertilizer out there and your plants start growing better. Okay, now I know how to fix that. Mm -hmm. Well, which organism group is it? Okay, now I know how to, I'll, I can look at that and figure it out. Interesting. Yep. Hmm. Wow. So what would be your biggest fear um, within your field of study? Um, I guess that we, um, don't reverse climate change early or fast enough. Mm. We know that we've got the way to sequester all of the carbon, elevated carbon that's in the atmosphere. If everybody started composting correctly mm -hmm. and really did it according to getting all the biology, all those organisms into the soil, bacteria sequester an immense amount of, of carbon. Fungi, 10 times that. Mm -hmm. um, the microarthropods, all those different organisms, they are sequestering a lot of carbon. Fungi are probably the most important. Um, the work by um, Dr. David Johnson at New Mexico State University showing that um, if you had um, just um, a soil that you inoculated for the first time with, with fungi, as you start to grow that fungal biomass. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at fungal biomass along this curve, well, the amount of um, carbon sequestered in the soil um, goes up and up and up just directly. It's, it's a nice 45 degree um, graph, basically. Mm -hmm. So in dry, semi-arid parts of the world, he's showing that he can sequester 11 tons of carbon dioxide mm. per hectare okay. per year in the top six inches. Well, what if you've got 12 inches? Well, mm -hmm. you just doubled that, it's now 22. Right. What if you go down another foot? 
Well, now it's 44. How about if you have soil deep enough that the root systems are going, as long as you're maintaining that fungal biomass. Mm -hmm. Now, how about if you get into a slightly wetter system? So in a mesic, um, you know, just the Great Plains of the United States on the east side of the Mississippi, for example, mm -hmm. where you more or less get rainfall events throughout the whole entire growing season, right. you can be sequestering something like 45 tons of carbon per hectare mm -hmm. per year. Wow. So, okay, now what if we go to a tropical system? Mm -hmm. We can be um, sequestering um, double that wow. in a tropical system. It depends on whether you it's a rainforest and you've got rain all year long or whether you have a dormant season where it's dry and things aren't growing. Okay, mm -hmm. you're not going to sequester as much carbon. But if you look at all of the parts of the world where we're doing agriculture and where it would be very easy to get the biology back into the system, we could be sequestering enough carbon mm. in three years to be lower the carbon content in the atmosphere, the, the CO2 in the atmosphere down to pre-industrial levels in wow. three years. Wow. But that means everybody right. has to be composting. Everybody has to be doing it right. right That's right. going to be a massive, well, so how about six years? Could we go six years? Because then that would get, well, so I think realistically, mm -hmm. if we can get going on getting people to really start into this and get moving on it within 12 years, mm -hmm. we could have all of that elevated CO2 back into the soil wow. from whence it came. Wow. That's incredible to think about yep we're, we're just we're page. just gonna have to unload a few uh, <clears throat> chemical fertilizer salesmen yeah <laughs> that's it <laughs> no uh, no problem <laughs> uh, those people who make five billion dollars in profit oh every gosh. quarter <laughs> Ooh, wow yeah so on yeah. a lighter note what would you be what is what are you most excited for um in the future with your field of study um figuring out all of all of these interactions and well it's like just in the last couple of years mm -hmm. there's these guys at rutgers university that have been working with the root tips of plants and what are the exudates coming out of the root tips of the plants and they noticed that there would be places and some places on those root tips all of a sudden all of the cell wall material would basically just disappear hmm. And all the bacteria that were hanging out right below that root tip on presumably the exudates that are coming out of that root could migrate inside that root tip. And then the mm -hmm. plant would replace all of the cell wall material. And so now it's a real, the bacteria can't get out. Mm -hmm. And then it does basically does bleach and it causes the same thing to happen to all the bacteria that it pulled in. And all of the nutrients are starting to come out of those bacteria and into the plant solution. And as all of this is going on, the bacteria start marching up the outer layer to where the root hairs are starting to grow. And those bacteria escape. I don't know, there must be like an exit, mm. <laughs> an exit sign <laughs> this way, this way, because they all get out. Mm. And you, most of us don't think of it being able to escape the root system right it's got this big gaping hole in it or something or these <laughs> bacteria get out and as they move down towards the root tip they all recover their cell wall material they all start mm. pulling in more nutrients all that soluble stuff that didn't get taken up by the plant and now they're hanging out down here around the root tip again hmm. waiting for the plant to suck them all in i think of it as okay this is the bacteria's version of a roller coaster hmm. back around and around and this is like okay we got done with the last red let's get back down here and get into red we want again oh again God. let's do it again and then back they go i don't i'm not sure that it actually works quite <laughs> that <be> routinely awesome. <laughs> but it certainly sounds like what they're saying is going mm. on with this process called rhizophagy. Mm. And 
So it's another way for plants to be able to get the nutrients that they require from these microorganisms that mm -hmm. the plant is feeding, that the plant is telling what to do, mm -hmm. what to get into its body, just as another way of getting those nutrients out of the bacteria. Hmm. What if there's more and different ways? We haven't even begun to understand yeah. root, root systems, much less the biology that goes along with them. Right. You know, we all know about mycorrhizal fungi, that that's the fungal version of rhizophagy, mm -hmm. which is to pull in all the nutrients and pump it to the plant. And for doing that for the plant, the plant gives them sugars so right. that they can continue to grow. It's the, the whole plant, everything about a plant is mutualistic. Right. It doesn't kill stuff. Mm -hmm. It promotes the growth of the beneficial organisms. And we as human beings need to learn that lesson. You promote the good guys. You don't promote the bad guys. Right. Yeah. Easily said. I love it. Yeah. Um, easily said. Yeah. Hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> We've got some challenges. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. So what advice uh, would you give people that are interested in soil science or microbiology? Um, take courses in this. Mm -hmm. um, there are universities that are um, developing these kinds of programs. Um, come and take the um, classes for uh, at the Soil Food Web School. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll have and, to link that below for people to come visit. Great. Yeah, um, and you know, if if you do want to make um, this your life's work, mm -hmm. become a consultant. Become one of the lab tech people. Yeah. Um, or working with farmers, you just have to do the FC. You don't have to be that crazy, wildly um, quantitative when you're doing the, this kind of work with just with growers. Mm -hmm. um, they just need to, they need somebody there to, to help them understand, okay, you gave me this um, page full of numbers. What do they mean? Mm -hmm. So this is 10 and that is 25. Is that good? Yeah. And so you start helping growers figure out what to do so they don't have to be using the toxic chemicals, the pesticides, inorganic fertilizers, um, herbicides, all of those things and mm -hmm. increase yields. So um, reduce costs, reduce the time that they have to take growing their plants, um, increase the quality of their plants so they're gonna get more money uh -huh. for uh, what they're doing. Um, who wouldn't change? and start working with the biological system. Right. So besides your school, uh, do you recommend any other resources that people can look into or? Um... It's always useful to look into, you know, like, um, oh gosh, I love it when my brain goes, yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Re, not resurgence, Re, regenerative ag. Regenerative, yes start reading things from regenerative ag because often mm. they don't really know why we mm. supply the why things work um and you want to go through what they're talking about in regenerative ag knowing about the biology so you can pick the right things to do same thing in permaculture mm -hmm. they're usually very good at telling you how to get really good foods for fungi in the soil right. how to um Fungos, yeah uh, yeah, and and you know the around your house is the place where where you're going to do most of the work. So that's where you want your plants that require mm. a lot of time and attention. Right, and right. The next rung out, it's these other kinds of plants that need a little bit of attention part of the year, and then the things that don't really need any attention most of the year. Mm -hmm. Well, what yeah. if we could make everything in your property stuff that doesn't really need much attention? Yeah. Right. And grows really, really well. Hmm. So there's a few things that you would want to drop out of a permaculture system because it doesn't really go along with your getting the biology back into the system. Right. Well, and then think about organic. Um, we've, there's a whole training that needs to be done there because they're recommending things that kill the hmm. very biology that they require. The reason organic folks always have problems with weeds is that their response to seeing some weeds grow is to till it. Mm -hmm. Well, you just wiped out 50% of all of your good, good guys just went, right. and now two weeks later, you're going to till again. Your biology did not have the chance to recover. Right. And now you're right. tilling again. Oh, man. 
I know organic growers that till 14 times in a single growing season. Why? And they just can't understand why they keep having weeds. Right. You're just because, replanting them too. And... Yep. It's <laughs> well, and you know, any seed that comes to the soil surface, uh, guess what? It's a weed. Yeah. Um, and it starts <laughs> growing. Uh, and then use of lime and gypsum. Hmm. You know, they're told that they've got to get the lime and the gypsum into, you know, six times more lime than gypsum, or no, sorry, six times more lime than um, magnesium. Mm. And if that ratio is out of whack, they need to put more lime out. You can't put more than 100 pounds per acre of mm. lime okay. without starting to kill your right. beneficial organisms. Right. So the recommended amount of lime is three tons of lime per acre mm. in order to get that calcium magnesium ratio back up where it needs to be. Three tons. A ton is 2,000 pounds. That's 6,000 pounds of lime going out on their fields when they That's shouldn't so be applying more than 100 pounds. Wow. What do you think they're doing to their soil? Yeah. When they put on that much lime. Burning stuff. Um. Yeah, they're burning it. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, lime is a salt. Yep. And you're causing harm to the root system of your plant if that seed germinates and if it starts growing, it's going to have to be a pretty strong <laughs> um, to be able to deal with salt right. levels like that. That's just crazy. Wow. And the wear and tear on their tractors and spreading mm. that stuff and tilling it in just insanity wow so we like to get short low undergrow um you know undergrowing plant species mm -hmm. so all of the soil is covered completely right. all of the time mm -hmm. so it's like a pot sitting on your black window you want a nice layer of um irish moss or mm -hmm. you know some cute little um clover that only grows um two three inches tall Right. To cover all of the surface of that pot. And then here's your nice, beautiful plant growing. Hmm. And it will tend to hold the blossoms. It will produce blossoms earlier, hold them longer. You don't have to water. The worst thing that people do is overwater hmm. because they've been, the, their experience has always been, uh, they put the water in and it just goes right out the bottom. Right. It doesn't happen if you've got really good soil and you've got a good amount of organic mm -hmm. matter. You yeah. don't want to be overwatering at all. You would yeah. never want to see the bottom of your pot have water sitting in it. Right. So yeah. don't overwater. Yeah. Teaching people how not to put too much water <laughs> on when their whole life they've been taught, put on more, put on more, yeah. put on more. Yeah. Well, love your plant too much, just a little too much sometimes. Yeah. Smothered like it. To do. <laughs> yes. Wow. Smothered it with my love. It yep. died, poor baby. <laughs> oh, so. you have been a joy to talk to. I feel like I could talk to you all day about anything and everything. So um, yeah, thank you for coming on Flora Funga Podcast. And Hopefully I'll have you on again or we'll, we'll keep in touch because this was a really fun chat and um, yeah. How can people uh, find you or contact you further if they're interested? And so info at mm -hmm. soilfoodweb.com. Okay. So the soil food web school, mm -hmm. you can go on our website. And so, um, you know, www.soilfoodweb.com. Perfect. Go find our website and uh, have some fun. Lots of information yeah, on yeah, the, like website. the website. Yep. And then mm. you can see all over the world where the different people that we've trained are located. And maybe they'd like to become one of those little yeah. stick pins that go yes. in there. Yes, be a consultant, help out the world, help out people. And help the soil. sequester all that carbon back into the soil where it's supposed to be and will yes. help your plants grow. Perfect. So, I love yep. it. Well, All thank right. you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. To thank you for be able to spread the news. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on here and talk to me today. So is there anything else you'd like to say or anything oh, I did not ask? 
We talked I, about a lot, but <laughs> yeah, I I could go on and on. As I said, I I give five day courses all the time. Perfect. Um, so <laughs> we'd have to get a little more into the details on things. Yes, but there are indeed seven overwhelming benefits, mm -hmm. overarching principles that we talk about a lot in the school, mm -hmm. and it's really important that everybody learns all seven of those things. So we've talked about four, maybe five of them here. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple more that okay. you need to come learn about. Perfect. A little tease at the end. I like that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you, Dr. Eileen. I, I, love, I love this talk today. So Okay, great. Thank you very much. Have a you're great gonna, day. You're going to let us know when it comes up on your podcast? Oh, for sure. I will uh, send uh, the link to the podcast um, through the email that I've been contacting you. So if that is okay. That's right. Yeah, that's great. That's good. Perfect. Just uh, remind Cade that he has to let um, marketing know okay. That, okay. that that's coming up so we can announce it several times on our Perfect. website to make certain that people come to watch the, yes. this podcast oh thank you very much yeah i will i'll keep you updated with the date and uh my release so thank okay. you very much great right. have a good day yeah you too see ya thank you yep ciao <laughs> bye